I'm Lynn Manuel Miranda, and you're listening to Hard Knock Life. Welcome to Hard Knock Life. I'm Keith Chow. I'm Brittany Monet. Hey, Brittany. It's been a, a lot since our last podcast, hasn't it? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so we've been anticipating the SAG after strike for a while now. In fact, you know, a couple episodes ago, we were like, we're recording on Friday. We don't know if they're striking. And so they mm-hmm. finally made the decision last week to strike. SAG after went on strike, joining the Writers Guild. Yes. It's funny because like you and I were just having a conversation about what that means for quote unquote influencers or, you know, where the nerds of color falls in that dichotomy between influencer and journalists, because there have been some confusing statements, rules, messages from SAG, from influencers, from people on social media about what it means to talk about Hollywood IP pop culture that kind of fuels the content that we create. Yeah. There is no, clear guidelines but i want to get this out the bat someone did ask sag after about cosplaying so cosplaying anything from film or tv shows is going to be an issue i think they said comics and video games are okay but unfortunately if it's anything from comics or video games now that have turned into live action film or tv shows i think now that falls falls under the umbrella of you can't cosplay them because now that's considered like supporting studios And now everything is in this very weird, like, you're not sure what you can do because you don't want to get in trouble, especially if you are someone who cosplays even podcast and, you know, potentially is like a reviewer for certain websites, you might be falling under like the influencer umbrella. And if you do want to be a SAG after a member at some point in your life, this will like pretty much stop you if you're considered scabbing, you won't be able to join SAG so it's making this very hard for certain people like where they fall into and what they can do right now in this you know time being yeah and I think it's it is kind of illustrative of the blurred line between journalists and influencers that social media YouTube has kind of created over the last several years particularly like folks who are in the nerd space who cover the kind of nerd culture stuff that we do here at the Nerds of Color, where you're talking about comic book movies or, you know, sci-fi, fantasy. There is there is a, a fine line between fan and critic. And yeah. it's funny because, like, all of this confusion, all this controversy about, like, what can we do, what can't we do? Because at the same time, I do want to make it clear, SAG has not called for a boycott. You know, there's a difference between boycotting the studios and what they're doing, striking and, yeah. and asking for, you know, fair wages. There's it, it's a strike. It's not a boycott. So I think there's also that kind of like confusion, because to your point, if I'm not an aspiring actor, if I'm not an aspiring writer and I'm wearing like a Batman T-shirt, am I scabbing? No. Right. Like, I think that's the but there's confusion no. because people are like, but that's supporting Warner Brothers and everything. So I think we have to, you know, one, I think it, there is confusion because I don't think folks have have determined what's what. But I do think it's important to like find out you know and we're not going to be able to give the definitive answer because we don't know i at least i'll say i don't know and i don't want folks to like point to us and say well keith and Brittany said so yeah it's tough it's a tough time right now yeah i would just honestly um whatever social media platform you're on hopefully there is a sag after account where you can like get updates or email them yourself i know they said in terms of reviewing episode five and six of the secret invasion is okay however it's just like for certain people who may fall under more uh, unfortunately under the influencer category you might not be safe so it's kind of like trying to figure out where exactly you fall under you know for me I know I don't think I would say I'm a full-on reviewer because I don't do reviews in the same sense that you or Suara does Mm -hmm. so I feel like for me it might be a little different especially since I have done even if it's just for like friends projects I have done voiceover stuff and I have some other voiceover stuff coming out soon that which the project I'm currently working on which I can't really talk about you know but unless you're you're not working on like a studio backed project right like if you're if you're working on an independent project or like a kickstarter backed project 
that's fine because like for example mark bernardin who's you know friend of the show uh tv writer co-host podcaster with kevin smith he is still going to san diego comic he announced this on social media he's a tv writer but he's striking but he's still going to comic-con to promote his independently created short film that he produced all his own it's not backed by a studio so i think you know if you're working on a friend's project if you're working on like an indie project that doesn't have any studio backing that's still essentially a non-studio project yeah so i think you're safe there but as, you know but as an aspiring sag member i understand yeah. like you have a a lot of like anxiety about like what can i can i talk about on social media yeah yeah exactly and that's why i'm not sure with like certain things I have like you know done that it could put me in a, a position of like oh she's doing this so it's more of an influence category than like a regular reviewer if that makes sense yeah well and you know I think again it goes back to like that line that distinction between fan and critic because you know I was saying before we started recording the nerds of color was formed because it was meant to be a place where fans could critique the properties we love right so it's it's not the same thing as like promoting in the sense that like a studio is going to send us shit and be like, oh, this is great. You know, uh -huh. truth be told, we've kind of like veered in some of that territory over the last several years, not calling anybody out. It's just the nature of the beast, right? That's how you pay the bills. Like you're going to get invited to screenings. You're going to get invited to set visits. And, you know, I think it's important to have a voice like the Nerds of Color at those places to hold some of those, you know, properties to account, and which is, again, the the fundamental birth of this website 10 years ago by the way we're we're approaching our 10-year anniversary at the nerds of color That's was crazy. not as an influencer at least not an influencer in the sense that we are being paid by the studios to influence fans to buy shit for the studio mm -hmm. if anything we're an influencer in the sense that our opinions matter and our critical opinions change things right mm -hmm. like asian american iron fist and whitewashed yeah. out like all of those things are considered influencing but not in the sense that like ain't no studio was giving me money <laughs> to promote asian american iron fist let me tell you that right now yeah it's but still, it's also like tricky which i hate because it puts us in this weird thing of like we just can't at least for me i i think you mm. might be fine but for me i'm not 100 percent sure and i just like i said i don't want to yeah potentially ruin. for what it's worth and we're going to announce right now that we're going to put the show on hiatus at least through the end of july we're, so we're going to miss Barbenheimer and Comic-Con, which is fine. I think it's, you know, we were we we're kind of like questioning how we were going to cover that shit anyway, right? Like, yeah, particularly like we weren't going to go to Comic-Con this year and all that's kind of, I mean, and it's funny because Comic-Con is also kind of realizing the consequences in the sense that this is going to be the first Comic-Con where there's no studio presence, at least for celebrities and like what makes Comic-Con Comic-Con, right? Like Hall yeah, H is the last be few years, years, yeah. Right. Like, I think they said Hall H is going to, they're they're going to cancel Hall H altogether on Sunday, I think. Like, no panels on Sunday, just because, you know, none of the studios are going to be there with the same kind of presence they normally would. Which, yeah. you know, I think is kind of a good thing, because Comic-Con should be about comics, but it kind of hasn't been for the last decade. Yeah, exactly. Like, I remember that Glee used to go to Comic-Con and have panels. <laughs> so, like, not not to knock on Glee, because, you know, I've been re-watching Glee, but, like, <laughs> it, it's just it's just interesting that, you know, that would be a show that would be at Comic-Con. Well, it's funny, because, like, when we first launched, when Nerds of Color first came out in 2013, like, there was a question about, like, what kind of content would we cover? Because, you know, we're the Nerds of Color, like our focus was fandom and, and nerd culture, but it was like, what, what defines nerd culture? And I used to say, and this was 10 years ago, I used to say, well, whatever would be at Comic-Con is the kind of stuff we would cover. And then, <laughs> which explains why we cover everything now, because like everything shows up at Comic-Con. Like to your mm -hmm. point, it doesn't have to be fantasy or sci-fi anymore. It could be a, a teen show or like a medical drama. It's like, what the fuck are you doing at Comic-Con? But exactly. so, so yeah, we, we do, we do broaden our horizons, but that said, we will we will take the next couple weeks off. So we're not going to cover the rest of Secret Invasion. We're not going to cover, unfortunately, Barbenheimer is not going to be covered by the podcast. I will also I want to also make clear the Nerds of Color is still going to be publishing content over the next several weeks. There is no one from SAG or WGA calling for a boycott saying you cannot write about things. I think to me, in my mind, as the editor in chief of the Nerds of Color. As long as you're publishing editorial content, opinion pieces, 
which include movie reviews, you are totally fine because you are critique. You are doing your job. You're critiquing a property. You're not endorsing it. You're not promoting it. Right. That's yeah. the difference between like just copy and pasting a press release or like posting on Instagram, some swag box the studio sends you, you know what I'm saying? Like that mm-hmm. is influencer shit that we will not. And I will make sure our staff knows to not engage in, but otherwise I think it's totally fine to write editorial content opinion pieces covering the stuff because at the end of the day the folks at nerds of color are reporters not influencers you know what i'm saying i think that's yeah. the, that's the difference no one is telling reporters to stop doing their job and if you want to write critical content about hollywood go for it and i think if anything the wga and the sag strikers will appreciate that right because <laughs> like if you want to point out david zaslov made 500 million dollars over the last five years Right. Like Bob Iger mm-hmm. made two hundred million dollars as CEO of Disney. And is and then folks are telling, you know, Deadline and Variety, oh, we're going to wait out the writers until they can't afford their homes anymore. That's our negotiating. Like and talk about how fucked up that is. Yeah, that is totally all, that is totally fine. I think SAG and WGA would be like, yes, please write and talk more about that. Yeah. Ron Perlman said he might, you know, there's so many ways to lose your house. So. Don't piss off Ron Perlman. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Don't fuck with Hellboy. Exactly. I feel like written stuff is okay, especially if you are acknowledging that there is the strike happening um, in both guilds. I think that is okay for sure. But like they haven't made it fully clear where podcasting falls under, even if it is, I think, a podcast for, you know, your website. It's not made, been made clear and I I would prefer not for us to be in a situation where we're all in trouble. Well, and I think, you know, and to, to that point, we do have a lot of actor friends. You know, you said you're an aspiring SAG member. Like there are blurred lines. I also think that the podcasting question is more for like actors who have podcasts too, right? Like I'm thinking yeah. like a Michael Rosenbaum or, you know, someone like that who like has a podcast is like, can I still do my podcast? Well, here are the ramifications. So I think that's a different level of you know because so many people everyone got their own podcast now you know what I'm yeah <laughs> so i think there's also that element too like the actors with podcasts can you continue doing your podcast versus like little rinky dink pieces of shit like me you know what I'm saying? like i don't think anyone gives a shit about me but Someone. that said you know we will we will respect your wishes and 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 I, I totally understand you know especially your confusion here about like what you can and can't do as an aspiring actors yeah, but I do like want to make it clear. As soon as guidelines are very, very clear on where I'm at and where I can be, I will, if I can come back like that, I will be back because I love doing this podcast. It's, you know, so much fun for me. Yeah, 100%. And and like I said, you know, we will continue to cover the strike. We'll continue to co- cover things on the on the editorial side. I'm, I may also, you know, release a few podcast episodes for the other podcasts that we do i don't know haven't decided it might just take the break and <laughs> just take a break right but mm-hmm. at, you know that said you know if if the strike continues if if the guidelines say that you know Brittany, as an aspiring if you want to join sag one day you can't do a podcast i totally understand that as well we will we will find ways to move move on and 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 of course welcome you back once the strike you know hopefully the strike is over not so that we can get our content because like you know we love our mm-hmm. consuming shit we i hope the strike is over soon because actors and writers you know are guaranteed a fair wage and are not easily replaced by robots and you know can afford healthcare like that's that's what this is all about this is not about like you know the, the, i've seen i've seen a lot of rumblings from people especially in the fan space who are just like upset that Deadpool got shut down or like, you know what I mean? Like, you know, yeah. like th- there are all these, like, you know, we talked about last week, like the set leaks from, you know, Wolverine or whatever. And now people, Oh, but they shut it down. And it's like, it's bigger than just, I mean, part of the problem is fans who are like, all you care about is like, you know, celebrating Fox's acquisition by Disney rather than like thinking, oh shit, this just means the rich are going to get richer and the poor are going to get poorer. Yeah, exactly. A lot of people have a misconception too that just because someone is on film or TV that, you know, especially as actors, that they're all rich regardless of, right. you know, they have one speaking line or they have like, you know, um, all of them. 
that's a huge misconception. It's only 1% of actors and actresses who make the kind of money where they can, you know, go a while without like having jobs back to back and be fine. Most actors are working paycheck to paycheck. And I know a lot of people were making fun of Sydney Sweetner or however you say her name. Sweet, Sweeney, yeah, yeah. That like, you know, she said that she cannot afford to take like even a six month break from work. Which, you know, for some actors, it seems like that's what's going on. But the fact that, you know, she's making it clear is because, you know, what act, what it says, what her actor's net worth is not their actual net worth. Even like the really crazy rich ones, that's still not their net worth because it's not taking into account the money that goes to their agents. If they have lawyers, if they have publicists, if they have a stylist, like all of that unfortunately comes out of their paycheck so that is not the money that they are taking home at the end of the day and then it doesn't include like any of the money that's just being taxed too in general i read like the average salary because the thing too like Mm -hmm. acting is not like a nine to five like where you you just here you make you know forty thousand dollars a year you know like you said it's it's basically you're just freelancing from gig to gig but like if you average out all actor salary the average is like twenty nine thousand a year Mm-hmm. which is like you know first of all it ain't cheap to live in LA or New York right <laughs> so if you you're an actor making 20 grand you're not you know you're going to have to have several side gigs just to pay the rent you know exactly what I mean? that- and and that's the thing like you know there was a an article about orange is the new black from Netflix you know that that show that came out 10 years ago and how none of the actresses on that show even though it was like a big hit for Netflix could like afford you know to pay the rent even though they were on one of the biggest shows on streaming because part of the problem part of the reason people are striking is that the streamers have made residuals obsolete have made ratings opaque so you don't even know how many people are watching Mm -hmm. and how much you're owed you know because that's the thing people don't realize like the the way folks used to make money being on tv or being in a movie is that okay you get your you get your upfront fee whatever that even if you're tom cruise or you're like the extra you Mm -hmm. get a upfront fee you know 20 million dollars or a thousand dollars whatever it is you get that and then depending on the deals you make you get a residual check every time that show comes on tv every time that movie's aired on hbo or tnt every time it comes on you get a residual and that residual could be a hundred bucks. It could be thousand dollars. It could be 10 cents, but you get something. Yeah. You know? Like my friend Perry, who's an actor, Perry Shen, who was the star of Better Luck Tomorrow. He's done a lot of like TV roles. He used to post like images of like the paycheck when like the guest spot he did on the King of Queens would, would air. And mm-hmm. he would get like a check from CBS for like five cents, but at least it's a check. <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. The, check, the paper probably costs more than the actual <laughs> check. Unfortunately. I mean, there are, you know, streaming has really made it hard because i don't think people are getting the amount that they should be like there's right. probably more people watching those episodes and re-watching because like just think about how many times i've re-watched lost is just like <laughs> well you know someone made the point just today because disney announced ms marvel was going to be broadcast on i don't know if they said disney channel or abc or whatever but they're yeah. actually going to show ms marvel on broadcast and someone tweeted for the first time the actors from Ms. Marvel are going to see residuals because airing it on ABC or Freeform or whatever like broadcast channel it's going to be aired on, you're guaranteed the residuals. But that show has been streaming on Disney for the last year yeah. and you're not seeing any money for it because, again, Disney's just hoarding all of that information to themselves. They paid you what they paid you that day, your day rate or whatever. But all the back end stuff, you ain't seeing a penny because, yeah. You know, and it's like you could have had like say 20 people rewatch Miss Marvel like five times each and you're not getting paid for those even though it's just 20 people who rewatched it they watched it five times each you're not getting your paycheck for people who are keep rewatching your work like how it's supposed how it's supposed to be and that's why also there was this huge fight with like you know Scarlett Johansson and Disney Plus about you know the movie moving over to Disney Plus and how she wanted she was like I deserve a bigger cut and right. as much as I'm not a fan of her as an actress and blah, 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 whatever, she's right, though. She did deserve a bigger cut. It's, so it's just a whole, like, complicated and messy situation where actors, regardless, and she's someone who makes, you know, probably really a decent amount of money, 
but even her she's still not being treated right and not being compensated fairly like yeah i mean and that's it. at the end of the day like what the strike is about to your point people just see the big names and say like why why would a scarlett johansson or you know whoever care because they make 20 million dollars a picture but like the fact that they're striking you know they also know that there are day players there are you know extras there are background actors people who are you know in the union and still can't afford you know rent and can't afford health care like that because i think even if you're in the union you have to earn a certain amount before you can even qualify yeah, it, for health care it's, it's 26k a year but it's just like like you said when you break it down actors only making you know barely 29k and that's pretty much just like if you had one job at like yeah. a fast food place right like yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. you know so that's what some people don't realize how much that is like across the board for actors like they're making that type of money where yeah of course it's hard to stay financially afloat and that's why you'll hear like actors still having roommates and some of them are still like yeah I still do my waitressing job or you know maybe I do uber eats for like extra money or something like there are so many actors who work so many extra jobs just to like stay afloat and you know if actors aren't making that money to get their you know their health insurance they get like you can get kicked out of the guild for not making enough money to sustain your health insurance and they charge you and it's so yeah like this strike is a big big deal now yeah. like uh, actors did say like you don't have to delete your streaming services because that's not going to help them so don't delete your streaming service and like thinking you're helping <laughs> and i think they like it's okay to still watch movies or tv whatever it's okay to watch things but i think it's kind of like a gray area of where talking about it yeah 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 i mean I, for the for particularly for the you know for the actors and the writers who are striking here's a great example like oppenheimer opens this weekend they had all their premiere stuff last week which kind of you know they did all their promo did all their junkets and stuff so you're seeing you know if you're turn, tuning into youtube today you'll still see a bunch of like interviews with killian murphy and matt damon and all the actors but starting i believe what was it monday is when the strikes officially started last monday it was you know from that point on no more publicity so like they were having their london premiere when the actors all were all on the red carpet from killian murphy to emily blunt to robert downing jr all walked the red carpet but then when they made the announcement that sag had decided to strike they all left the premiere uh -huh. so christopher nolan even made the announcement from the stage that the cast had walked off before you get it twisted, folks, you know, Deadline tried to make it sound like Matt Damon did not support the strike on the red carpet where they kind of, you know, cut off his quote before he said that he was in full support of the strike, which kind of tells you, again, the blurred line between journalist and, you know, influencer slash fan slash, you know, show for the studios. Deadline variety, not calling out individual people who work for those publications, but a lot of that is also like access based and we don't want to say the wrong thing about certain studio heads because we don't want to get in trouble type thing. Mm -hmm. So putting that out the way, the the actors were told not to publicize. So Shola Madrino, who who recently, I think, posted on social media, you know, the trailer for Blue Beetle just came out and said, you know, I can't talk about the movie. I, I still want everyone to go see it, but I'm, I'm not going to talk about it, unfortunately, for the next few weeks. So like, yeah, it's... they can't promote their stuff. Again, there no one is calling for a boycott. So if Blue Beetle comes out. I think it actually will show the studios that like here's the thing. Like if Blue Beetle comes out and it tanks, that's not gonna you're not making a point to the studio. You know what I'm saying? The studio's exactly. still gonna be like, you know, we're not we're still not gonna oh like oh no, Blue Beetle tank when we're, we're gonna change our minds. That's not gonna make a difference in their mind. But I do think that it'll put the pressure on, you know, if you know, Oppenheimer does well, Barbie does well. It doesn't mean that like the the studios will continue to like be intransigent. You know, because here's the thing: what what the work stoppage means, what pressure that puts on the studios is that like they're eventually going to run out of content, and they're going to need more movies and more shows. And if there are no writers and there are no actors, there's not going to be shows for them to put out. You may see an increase in like reality program, which is what happened the last time the writers went on strike. That's why mm -hmm. there's a lot more reality shows now. 
but writers and actors have not gone on strike together in 60 years this is like unprecedented in modern times Mm -hmm. so you know the actors striking with the writers and and i bet who knows right because like bob Iger was out there last week just saying some crazy shit about like how the actors and the writers are unreasonable when he's again making 200 million dollars a year (laughs) and writers and actors making twenty thousand dollars a year like what's unreasonable there yes exactly like i'm sorry everyone and i know like most people who listen to this podcast believe this i hope so that everyone deserves a livable wage and you know not having to work like an actor is a little different because they are freelancers but still at the end of the day you still deserve to make a livable wage from your acting projects or if you are a writer you deserve to have a livable wage you don't you shouldn't be having to be like okay well let me also work uber and do this and do that just to make sure that i'm financially afloat like it should not have to be like that for anybody we should not have to work multiple jobs if we don't want to and and let's not forget like the reason why streaming is at the heart of this whole thing is because and we talked about it right like from the other side where we used to say like well now all the studios like own their own libraries and you know like again at the end maybe it's good for the consumer right like you would think like for all the fans out there, like wants to tune into Disney plus to see all the Marvel shit and tune into HBO max to see all the DC shit. But then, you know, fans started complaining. Cause like, why are they canceling these projects and re- removing these shows from, from the uh-huh. service? Because they can, because they they're essentially without having to license out their shows to other networks or to other distributors, uh-huh. they hoard all the money now. Yeah. Right. Because that's the other, the other thing that was different is like when Warner brothers licensed a show to a different, you know, studio, like, for example, Big Bang Theory was a Warner Brothers production, but Mm -hmm. they licensed it out to CBS to air. That money from that deal goes to the actors and the producers too, right? Like, so Mm -hmm. there was all these kind of like different points in which people could make money on a thing. But with streaming, that that revenue stream is cut off now. So, So there isn't that extra fee that goes to the actors or the writers, right? And now we don't have to, you know, share our ratings. We don't have to give you residuals. And then in the meantime, David Zaslav, Bob Iger, Reed Hastings, they're all making hundreds of millions of dollars doing this. Yeah. That's the that's the fundamental unfairness of it all. Exactly. Just deeply unfair that so many actors are like, I even saw some actor tweet about like one of her friends, I think, is still working as a barista who is in Blue Beetle. Mm-hmm. And it's like, you know, and she's like, I have to move back home because I can't afford it. And I just had my drink made by my friend who's going to be in a DC movie coming out <laughs> next month. Like that is so like, like the thing that, you know, someone is in this like, you know, big movie that's coming out next month and they're still having to like be a barista. Like not that there's anything wrong with being a barista. It's fun, but it's yeah. like, it's very unfortunate that so many people have to work these multiple jobs just to stay financially afloat it's just it shouldn't be like that because it's stressful having to do all that and coordinate everything yeah you're right and you know and i think the best outcome is that the producers the studios the writers actors we want this work stoppage to come to an end again not because we're just greedy for more content we wanted to come to an end because that means the writers actors and studios have come to a, an agreement that fair wages health care <laughs> you know not replacing people with AI. Did you see the story about like one of the proposals was that AI, they they wanted to be able to scan your face if you're like mm-hmm. a background person. So you get, you know, you I don't know if you've ever done extra work, but like, you know, though you can come on set yeah. for like a day, get a couple hundred bucks. And, you know, that's great. You can add that to your resume, you put that on your INDB and you get experience being on set. But at least, you know, you're getting paid for your labor. What they were proposing is that all those people getting you know day rates come on we'll scan your likeness and now own your likeness in perpetuity so that we don't have to ever bring you back to be a background player again yeah like, <laughs> what the fuck? It, it's that's just it's it's just crazy like it makes like no you don't need to have ai that much involved in the arts like it shouldn't really even have to be a thing but the fact that it's even that extreme or now that you have or like a lot of actors who are on, you know, shows that do fairly well are being found found out that they're being scanned mm-hmm. and having to do this stuff like, yeah, because now they're taking your likeness to use it so that 
they have it. And I know, I, and I saw other people like, well, the good thing about it, AI is if like, oh, say an actor dies untimely, now you have their stuff in the AI database and you can just keep going on with the thing. And it's like, no, no. <laughs> like, no, did Rogue One teach you nothing? We don't want that. We don't. We don't. <laughs> and especially with Rogue One, as much as I love that movie, it still makes it just not okay because Carrie Fisher was obviously upset with like the fact that they used AI you know, they could have just cast honestly. They could have just cast someone else entirely and just. Had or even it. like, and not just Carrie. I mean, Carrie was still alive when that movie. But Peter Cushing, like the Grand Moff Tarkin, was a whole ass character in that movie, even though he was yeah. dead. <laughs> you know, like that 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 kind of thing. Yeah, and and you know, we've talked many times about the Flash kind of resurrecting dead people in the end of that movie too. Like it's it's coming right, but at the very least, like e- even if we were going to use AI, I think part of any deal that gets made going forward is that you have to like come to terms with the actors whose likeness you're using because i think what what the studios want is just to be able to own your own your likeness forever mm-hmm. right so and which is kind of like the the point of i've seen a lot of comic book artists kind of saying hey yeah we should all stri- oh wait we don't have a guild like so one I, I think comic book artists and writers should unionize that would be mm-hmm. that would be great but that but a lot of artists are saying like you know dc and marvel own anything you do for them. Like if you ever get hired to write or draw for mm-hmm. Marvel and DC, anything you create belongs to them. Yeah. And you can't just say nothing about it, right? And a lot of artists see their work get used for different purposes and they can't complain about it because that was what they the agreement they entered into. So <laughs> maybe the next, you know, shoot a drop would be writers and comic book artists unionizing first. Like I said, everyone deserves to make a livable wage. And being able to at least, you know, at least pay rent without like, you know, having to work 20 million jobs. Like, you know, it's just inflation, everything. It's just, it's terrible. And something needs to change across the board, not just in the, you know, entertainment industry, but like everywhere. It just, everything needs to. Well, and and you're seeing labor, labor stoppages happening in, in multiple industries, right? Like, I think as we're recording this, UAW is going on strike there's a potential for the UPS workers to go on strike. So like, I think as you see the inequality rising and, and again, the, the gap is between the, the, the CEOs and the people who work for them. Mm-hmm. It's just gotten bigger and bigger and bigger. Cause here's the thing, like, you know, there's a case to be made that capitalism is the root of all evil. And that's the reason why we're in this predicament. But I like this quote that, Elizabeth Warren used to say on the presidential campaign when she ran a few years ago is that like the problem isn't just capitalism but it's this unfettered capitalism it's capitalism with no rules because there there should there used to at least be rules in place <laughs> that mm-hmm. if we're going to be a capitalist society we should at least follow certain rules so that we try to make things as fair as possible those have been thrown out the window right like yeah. the fact that Warner Brothers and Discovery could have merged to become this giant conglomerate is already like there are a lot of antitrust things about that that like people just kind of look the other way nowadays again even fans right like we love that Disney bought Marvel because it means that like now we can get all this Marvel shit and then when they bought Fox even better right like no (laughs) it's not better (laughs) lack of competition is not better at the end of the day right one one person being in charge of everything is not a good thing no it's not we need to come back to yeah, I understand in terms of like, hey, all of the Marvel characters are now uh, in the same house for the most part. Like, I, but still, it's like, <laughs> it, it's not the only thing was that acquisition was not just acquiring the Marvel comics, it's literally <laughs> everything that right. Fox has. So, it a lot of people lost jobs and a lot of things were cut. And, you know, now they're making even more cuts. And the fact that Disney is pulling stuff off of their platform, it's crazy. It's because, again, they're trying to avoid as much as possible being in the whole like residuals and paying people. So they're pulling stuff off. Like you're not going to have those shows that, Oh, that show has a cult following. Like, right. It's it's not because it's, it's going to be gone. You can't find, and you know, you, you and I are proponents for physical media. Like when you're solely relying mm-hmm. on streaming and, and you know, the, the big bosses, I don't want to make that available anywhere. No one will ever see it. Like Batgirl is never going to be seen. As long as David Zaslav is alive, there was never going to see Batgirl, right? Because of a tax write-off. Because that means I can hoard more money for myself. Because, you know, like people say, well, you know, Leslie Gray is Brendan Fraser. They got paid for it. What do they care? 
they got that one payment for it. But when you enter into a movie, like I said earlier, it's not just that upfront fee that you get for being in the movie, right? Like there's also like you get money for when it's distributed. You get money for when it's sold, you know, the theatrical release versus the home video release versus TV rights. Like all those things and and merchandising, right? Like all those things are not available now to those actors because exactly the CEO said, nope. I want to I want to write down for my own tax write off. Yeah, and then like I said, and then again, those actors, you know, their money still gets taxed, and then they still have to make sure their agents and managers and publicists all get paid first. Like all of the money goes to all of that first before they get to keep any of it. And speaking of DC, like I still wonder, you know, right before the strike was announced, James Gunn had a flurry of casting announcements, right? Like we already knew about Dave Cornswit and Rachel Brosnahan a couple weeks yeah. ago, which was kind of weird. Like the way they announced it was just like a variety drop and it wasn't any kind of, you know, we, you and I suspected, well, they're maybe anticipating a strike. So there won't be like a Comic-Con presence, which is yeah. kind of how it's played out. But then last week it was like, here are all these random superheroes that are going to be in Superman legacy played yeah. by like Nathan Fillion, Isabella Merced. And it was just like, why are they announcing all these now? You know? And yeah. it got me wondering, like, I'm still kind of like suspicious of uh, James Gunn because he is part of the WGA, right? He's mm-hmm. a writer. He's a screenwriter. He's written all his movies. So he's got to be a member of the WGA, but he's also a studio head. So like, what kind of predicament is he in? You know, we we made this joke a couple weeks ago when the WGA went on strike. Mm-hmm. Like, can James Gunn stop writing Superman Legacy? Like, if he makes a tweak to the script, is that considered scabbing? You know, all that stuff. But now yeah. also, like, casting these actors and, like, he hasn't said anything about either strike. And it's funny because his brother, Sean, has been very vocal. Oh, recently. yeah. Extremely. But James still out. hasn't said anything. And I'm just kind of like, and his wife is an actress. So like, I would just wonder, what, is it because he's, like, you know, beholden to David Zaslav, which is... Probably, you know, I, but, but that's kind of problematic too, you know. I, I feel like he's probably in a position where he can't say anything, even if, and you know, maybe I am wrong about James Gunn, but I feel like he would be in support of his brother and would want to speak up about all the like mystery you would think. on both sides. But it's just, I don't know if he can now because of he's now a studio head. So it's just like, I, but that's I kind know. of fucked up. It's it's yeah. almost like who which side do you want? <laughs> are you getting are you striking or are you getting struck again? So it's like whether or not Superman Legacy comes out in 2025 is beside the point, but I do think that could be a consequence because you know, the last time the just the writers went on strike in 2007, that upended a lot of projects that yeah. were supposed to come out. So the actors and the writers going on strike, you know, just don't don't put in stone any movies that are announced for 2024 and 2025 is all I'm saying. Yeah, it's a good chance that they will not happen. Mm-hmm. The only things that are currently safe is animation, mm-hmm. but that's it. I don't know why animation isn't like following under it because they still use actors' voices and it's still being... Well, I think maybe because the actual animating, like the people drawing the scenes and, and that the VFX stuff is probably safe because their their union isn't on strike but like to your point you know i think with animation too the writing gets done ahead of time because you can't which yeah. is, which is kind of like what was fucked up about across the spider-verse apparently you, you know a story came out a couple weeks ago about how mm-hmm. Lauren Miller were like rewriting the movie after a lot of the like, animation was done and then like put the animators kind of like pressured to, to yeah. complete you know which is which is not the same as like you know filming actors because like animation takes so much longer to like if you just trash completed sequences that's a whole lot of manpower you just wasted Mm -hmm. and and you know it's funny because i was i was reading about lord miller's solo you know how they got fired off solo and a lot of that was because like you know the the way they improv and like rewrite on set is kind of like their Mm -hmm. signature but that's kind of why they got kicked off of solo because they were coming in over budget because they were taking too long to make a um, you know, movie and it was just like you know that kind of sounds like the problem with spider-man <laughs> but aye, aye, aye. It's, it's infinitely more pro- problematic with animation because it just takes so long to do but anyway just wanted to put this episode out to let you guys know where we stand on the strike and, yes. and of course Brittany, you wanted to express your 
concerns about like how you fall under the like the influencer slash journalist slash podcaster space. I think end of the day, we don't know. Yeah, we don't, uh, but I just think it's safer for right now until there's more clear guidelines. We'll take a break. That I'm, uh, yeah, I, at least for me, for sure. I mean, I am still seeing Barbie and Oppenheimer. Uh, <laughs> I just can't, like, I don't even know if, like, expressing my thoughts will, like, cross <laughs> over. So it's so, like, I don't know where I even stand on any yeah. of it. So I am seeing the, the movie. I am doing the double feature. But, yeah, I won't be able to probably talk. I won't probably talk about it publicly. So... If you guys want my thoughts, I'm so sorry. Yeah. Well, <laughs> if they do want to get in touch with you and maybe talk about the strike, how can they find you online? You can find me at Hi Brittany Monet on Twitter, Instagram, Hi Tumblr. That's pretty much it because I don't even know if I can promote my other podcast now. So. <laughs> well, if you're going dark on both podcasts, I guess not. Yeah. In the meantime, follow me on Twitter at the Real Chow, the underscore real underscore chow, and on Instagram and threads at Real Keith Chow. Follow the Nerds of Color at the Nerds of Color on all platforms. We are going dark on our podcast, but if you want to continue supporting our site and our channel, go to youtube.com slash nerds of color, watch our videos, subscribe, go to patreon.com slash nerds of color and consider supporting us there. If you want to continue the work that we do, even though the podcast is going to go away for a little bit, we still are going to be putting out work and you can continue supporting us. And until next time. Strike, 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 strike,